Okay, it is the six o'clock hour, so it is time to begin this meeting of Planning Committee for May 25th. Notice of collection. Personal information collected as a result of the statutory public meeting. Our meetings are collected under the authority of the Planning Act and will be used to assist in making a decision on this matter. Persons speaking at all at that meeting are requested to give their name, address, and recording for recording in the minutes. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes, which will be available to the public. Additionally, interested members of the public can e email the committee clerk or the assistant planner, assigned planner, if they wish to be notified regarding a particular application. Questions regarding this collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning Services. Public meeting reports. The second of tonight's public meeting is to present a planning application in a public forum as detailed in the public meeting report. These reports do not contain a staff recommendation and therefore no decision will be made this evening. Following presentations by the applicants, the meeting will be opened up to public for comments and questions. Following council decision, notice will be circulated in accordance with the Planning Act if a person or public body would otherwise have the ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the Ontario Land Tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. Okay, moving on to um, Zoning Bylaw Amendment 170-174, Earl Street. Can staff provide some information? Ms. Derrickson. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, notice was provided in accordance with the Planning Act as detailed in the public meeting report. Um, we've received no pieces of correspondence, uh, but one phone call. Uh, this is a statutory public meeting. Um, as you've mentioned, under the Planning Act, the purpose of which is for the applicant to present their proposal and the, to the public and the planning committee and answer questions. Um, as part of the public meeting, planning staff has prepared a public meeting report summarizing the proposal. It should be noted that no recommendations or decisions are being made this evening regarding this report. Planning staff are in attendance this evening to record the questions being asked and to address technical questions regarding the planning process. Feedback received will be addressed by planning staff within a future comprehensive report. Um, once technical review of the application is complete and staff are ready to make a recommendation. Thank you. So to the applicants, you have 15 minutes. I'll shut you down after 20, so please feel free. Start and be precise and concise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of committee, staff, and, and the public, if any of those who are here this evening, my name is Jason Sands. I'm here on behalf of the owners of 170, 174 Earl Street and 200 West Street to provide an overview with respect to the proposal for zoning bylaw amendment application. <clears throat> Just uh, to begin with the locational context of the property, you can see the map on the screen with the red dot identifying the subject property. Um, it's at a sort of a crossroads, if you will, on Earl Street, West Street, and Clergy Street in the downtown core in fairly close proximity to Queen's University, KGH, and the Central Business District. The property is uh, adjacent to some fairly notable properties, specifically the Frontenac County Courthouse, as well as Sydenham Public School. Um, there are also multiple parks, transit stops, et cetera, located in close proximity, 600 meters walking distance. From a sort of a bird's eye overview perspective, this uh, illustration provides an example of that, highlighting the property in, in yellow, uh, showing the, the Frontenac County Courthouse building to the, to the south. <clears throat> Um, of the subject property as well as the Sydney Public School to the west. Uh, this is a survey, topo survey of the lands. The property is fairly well sized for an urban parcel, uh, accommodating residential uses with respect to that size, approximately half an acre. Uh, as noted, it's got some multiple frontages, so there's frontage of 21 meters on clergy, 26 and a half roughly on Earl, and nearly 50 on West Street. The existing property accommodates a fairly recognizable heritage building uh, within the downtown core, and that recognizable building is essentially the terminating vista of Clergy Street. It's a prominent two and a half story building, contains a fair number of units, 15 units to be exact, and it was constructed in 1911. To the southernmost portion of the subject property, there's an underutilized building. It was originally developed as a stable, and it's essentially been used for storage for uh, 
the better set part of a century. Um, again, just an aerial shot to show, uh, uh, delineate uh, the subject property highlighted in yellow. Um, again, you, I think I've overviewed with respect to where that uh, is located. This image on the top left of the slide illustrates the, the prominent building taken from Clergy Street, uh, this photo. Um, again, two and a half stories, historic building. Uh, there, through this proposal, there's no change to that aspect of the project. It's proposed to be entirely located on the retained parcel um, and maintain all of the existing residential uses, on-site parking, amenity, et cetera. And the image on the right is the stable building that is in question through this application on the southernmost portion of the property. As you can see in this picture, it uh, shows the uh, lack of care, if you will, um, and upkeep that's been completed to some of the external components as well as the cupola. Some images to focus on the specifics of that uh, stable building. Um, top left shows some parking on the city right of way. The, right, the actual right of way and city road allowance extends to the garage doors of this, of this building. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more with respect to the zoning. Um, and the prop photo in the right is taken down from the Frontenac County Courthouse parking lot looking immediately north. So you're seeing the uh, southernmost facade of that uh, existing stable building on the subject property. Getting into the policies and how they relate to the subject property, you'll see on the right hand side of the screen, uh, the property is still located within the residential designation. However, it's immediately surrounded to the south and to the southwest with the institutional designation identified in purple. Uh, and that's largely running with the uh, institutional uses of the regional public library, uh, laboratory, sorry, uh, the public school, the courthouse, and then falling further to the west into the Queen's University area of the city. There are some sections of the official plan highlighted on the left-hand side, I won't get into detail. There's a planning report that speaks to those, um, runs through the criteria with respect to compat land use compatibility, appropriateness, uh, and redevelopment standards including urban design policies, uh, and um, also into the density policies. Within the OP, uh, residential projects up to a cap of 75 dwelling units per net hectare uh, or constitute a medium density uh, residential use. And this southernmost property that's proposed to be severed uh, does fall within that category. So the tests of section 33B2 have been completed uh, through that planning documentation overview. <clears throat> this is a continuation of the official plan. Uh, there are significant uh, OP policies that are applicable when reviewing a property and a proposed development such as this. And of note, uh, the property is located within the old Sydenham Heritage Conservation District. It's a designated property, protected. It's also adjacent to the Frontenac uh, County Courthouse, which is a national historic site. So there is a a fair number of uh, policies that are applicable to this land holding and this proposed redevelopment given the heritage protections that are associated with the lands themselves. With respect to the new zoning bylaw 2022-062, the uh, heritage zone three, uh, HCD3 zone is what applies to the subject property um, in its entirety. It does permit uh, multiple reforms of residential uses, so apartment buildings, uh, dwell duplexes, townhomes, triplexes, etc. And essentially what this site-specific zoning is proposing to do is introduce three units as a right on the severed parcel on the southernmost portion of the property and recognize the 15 on the uh, retained parcel on the southern portion. To do so, we uh, are proposing a site-specific uh, exemption overlay, HCD3 zone, to recognize the performance standards that fall out of compliance with that parent zone. So into the proposal itself, I've alluded to it, but the image on the right kind of explains it. The red and the blue is really what we're trying to accomplish from a parcel configuration perspective. The retained parcel to the north would maintain all the existing on-site development that accommodates residential uses to date, and the southernmost portion of the parcel, the severed parcel, is proposed to be rehabilitated, adaptively reused, and convert from a former underutilized stable building to a residential building that would accommodate up to three residential dwelling units. 
access to the property is proposed to be maintained. There's no changes. It all is directed off of West Street servicing as well. Um, with respect to the existing building, there are no changes. Um, and we're working through the technical review components with staff as it relates to addressing what deficiencies might exist from a zoning perspective uh, and come up with uh, appropriate standards that may be applicable to the severed parcel in the southern portion. With respect to the exciting stuff and the renderings of what this building may look like, here are some uh, <clears throat> preliminary examples that uh, Schultz and Zabak has prepared uh, to illustrate what this concept could essentially become should the adaptive reuse be uh, finalized. So essentially the footprint wouldn't change of that existing building, but the westernmost portion would be increased in gross floor area to accommodate some additional living space on the second story, as well as balconies primarily focused on the southern portion to direct and limit overlook. So it's not focused on the retained parcel on the northern portion, but focus it in under to that underutilized portion uh, of that surface parking lot on the southern portion of the parcel, um, or immediately south of the parcel uh, associated with the Frontenac Courthouse. These are some renderings that we tried to pull together that would just show what it currently looks like today on the top left and what it could look like in the future in the bottom right from sort of the same area, if you will, or perspective. So looking from the south, uh, to, from the south of the building, looking sort of northwest, you'll see the uh, existing limestone building facade and the proposed on the right. Again, from the southern perspective, looking north, the increase in GFA or gross floor area on the second story is visible from this, this image um, with sort of a tapered roof line to match the aesthetic of the roof line that's existing, but also accommodate sufficient ceiling heights that uh, may be utilized for residential uses. From the streetscape, they're proposed to be an improvement, yet maintain the existing facade, the existing garage uh, setup, and utilize that for on-site parking. Um, while accommodating the additional floor area at the rear of the building or the westernmost portion that you can see off in the distance where the, uh, the, the cars are located. Just another image, this is the northern facade. So looking at the existing, basically an underutilized portion used for gravel parking, garage doors and storage in the future, um, maybe residential uses that uh, are, are more apt to be uh, higher and better uses for a prime piece of property in the downtown core. The conceptual floor plans have been prepared just to, again to illustrate how this may, may be accommodated are, are here with the ground floor plan. And this is the second floor plan. Just in summary, going through the hierarchy of the policies that are applicable, the 2020 provincial policy statement has been reviewed. The entirety of the city of Kingston official plan has been considered. Uh, inclusive of the old Sydenham Heritage Conservation District policies given the location of the property. Um, with review of those, it's our opinion that this proposal is appropriate with respect to its adaptive reuse and it's, intense, and it's a form of intensification that the city desires in what we would consider gentle intensification, uh, utilizing existing servicing uh, in, in, this, in the city's core. We have also reviewed the uh, residential design guidelines for residential lots and in our opinion, it complies with the, those design guidelines. Um, there's been a heritage impact study completed with respect to how this complies uh, and addresses the policies of the conservation uh, district plan, uh, as well as the design guidelines. The unique thing about this project is that there's proposing to, the, op the owners are proposing to subdivide the parcel, which in, in turn increases the affordability of the land holding itself. Um, so there's not a requirement that a future owner may require, uh, may uh, be needed to purchase the entirety, uh, but it may be sold independently. It's, uh, I think, also, uh, as you could see on some of the renderings that have been prepared, uh, uh, an appropriate form of, of uh, a built form, uh, utilizing the historic fabric of the area, the existing building on site and ensuring that it's compatible with what exists uh, in the surrounding neighborhood, including the National Historic Site uh, directly south of the property. The other thing I want to point out is that these are conceptual plans that have been provided for the purpose of the zoning amendment to illustrate how uh, some further intensification may be accommodated on site and when a future owner or the owner pursues the actual development, there'd be necessity for additional permitting, including the heritage uh, approvals through, through uh, Heritage Kingston, 
uh, in garnering what would become the final design uh, at that time. So with that, um, we request, uh, it's requested that the site-specific zoning is appropriate and it represents good land use planning. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and that was outstanding at 12 minutes. Thank you. Uh, I will ask now, are there any questions or comments from the public? Are there any public members online? Oh, there we go. In person first. Please come to one of these microphones, and please give your name and your address. And you have five minutes. My name is Brian Reed. I live at 52 Clergy Street East. I've lived there since uh, 1974. We'll go ahead, and if you sit down, it'll be better into the microphone. Sure. There you go. I've seen a significant change in terms of the environment in the downtown core area. When we first moved in there, there was primarily single family homes. People that had worked and retired within the area raised families. As a result, over the years, we've, we've lost a high school. We, uh, we, I, I would suspect that Sydenham Public School is, is threatened. It seems the trend is to cater to Queen's University. And um, as a result, uh, there's been a downgrading in terms of the quality of maintenance of homes within the Sydenham Ward. Uh, this proposal here would be acceptable to me if it was a single family dwelling, which reflects the use of Earl Street and West Street as single-family homes. For a multi-unit multi apartment building, I find it unacceptable in terms of the rendering, the, the drawings. We can see that the present use of the area is used for parking. To add uh, apartment buildings to the area only increases the need in terms of additional parking for those, 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 those units. <clears throat> I think that the city council should be focused in terms of making a downtown core area an attractive area. And that only could be achieved by those people living in within the residence and ownership of the residence. People that are in apartment buildings have no concern uh, with respect to the maintenance of the property around the building. And we have already demonstrated that those owners have not maintained the properties. I would strongly suspect that if this proposal went through, there'd be a down, further downgrading in terms of downtown core area and also to a give incentive to other people that own buildings within the downtown core area to encourage multi-residence units. Therefore, I would strongly oppose any development in terms of multi-units and encourage single family ownership of, of residents within the Sydenham Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I will just at this time, oh, turn you, thank you. Uh, if there are any of the members who are participating in the meeting via Zoom, if you wish to speak, please use the raise hand button. It's at the bottom of your screen and we'll just give people a few seconds to use that if they wish to speak. Okay, to the applicant, um, what would you have to say about uh, parking? Is there gonna be enough? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, I, I first wanna, wanna thank the uh, gentleman who, who spoke. Um, with respect to the policy set in which was reviewed from the provincial policy down through the official plan policies uh, into the intensification policies of the city, um, it's our view that multi-res, or at least allowing for through, through an introduction of a zoning bylaw amendment in 2023 is consistent with that policy set and that, that that desire for intensification on urban services, given that it can function appropriately. And one of the points, uh, as we heard, was the respect or lack thereof of parking on site. One of the really key initiatives the city's undertaking that I understand is the parking paradigm shift uh, in trying to balance the active transportation components uh, of the city's investment, uh, specifically in the downtown core, with that of the personal use of automobiles. Um, and one of the drivers of that from a policy set was the exemption of on, uh, off-site, sorry, on-site parking, vehicular parking on designated heritage properties. So through this proposal, for example, on the severed parcel, we're proposing two vehicular parking stalls in the existing garage or in, on, on site. 
um, which was consistent with former policy that spoke to one parking stall required per residential unit, where now we understand there's sort of a shift and a desire for the city to encourage active transportation and public transportation and, and less dependence on the personal automobile. Um, so recognizing that uh, and trying to align this project with the intent, the morals, and the policies that have been set forth by the city, it's our opinion that, that there's appropriateness for the multi-res, even though there's only proposed to be two on-site parking stalls on the proposed severed parcel. Thanks. Thank you. And seeing that there's no one else here, oh, Mr. Barr, go ahead. Thanks, and through you, Chair, and I think there's a, an additional good point to bring up here is that uh, with the changes the province has made to the Planning Act, every single detached dwelling now on urban residential services in the province of Ontario can have up to three units on it. So even if this property, the one that's being severed and discussed here tonight, which is the conversion of the carriage house, was limited to a single detached dwelling as per the zoning bylaw, that would be irrelevant in the case of the changes made to the Planning Act and could have up to three units where appropriate. Thank you. Great. Uh, any questions from the committee? Questions? No need to sell us on your position. Okay. Councillor Shaves, go ahead. I guess since no one else wants to go, I'll take the floor. Sit tight. Um, just confirmation. This table is a heritage building. Okay. And are you redeveloping, like you taking down part of the stable, like the, the west end part of it, or are you just revitalizing the interior? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, a detailed assessment of the building and the structural integrity, uh, to my understanding, hasn't been done exhaustively at this point, as we're trying to just introduce the uses. Uh, however, that being said, it's my understanding that the, the reuse of the building, the footprint of the building, et cetera, will be done in the most uh, feasible way possible. So it would be utilized to, the, to what's there today as, as much as possible. Because I understand you're not actually developing this project, you're just presenting it because it's gonna be sold. So the, the final outcome, the diagrams and everything could be totally different from what you're presenting today, correct? Yeah, um, through you, Mr. Chair, to a degree, the uh, the conceptual plans that we've prepared uh, in support of this application are to demonstrate the ability for that severed parcel to be developed with residential uses, but it's not the owner's intention to take these through the entirety of the process, including Heritage Act approvals, et cetera, to build out this project. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a requirement to show and demonstrate how it could function should it be developed in the future. Okay, because in regards to Heritage, not that I'm on any of the heritage committees or anything, so I'm not no expert, but in your conceptual plans, the the west end part of the building has two floors and it doesn't look like the heritage portion. And I know in the last slide that you, pre that you presented, um, one of the lines said respects the existing built form of historic structure adjacent and adjacent buildings. I so I'm not sure if it actually I believe he said that those would not be the plans. That's just there for conceptual. The owner has not decided what they're going to do. Um, it's there like as a pretty picture. Well, in that case, I think it's kind of early to be sitting here <laughs> talking about this. Um, but let's continue. Uh, you always ask, also ask for an exemption of amenity area to 0.0, .0 meters and no bike spaces required. Uh, through Mr. Chair, I didn't catch the entirety of that, but I understood that the question was. Uh, we're required, or we're requesting to vary the front yard setback to zero meters. Is that is that right? No, I was referring to the amenity area, oh. common area. Yeah, through you understand. Yeah, the site specific bylaw that was drafted incorporated a zero uh, square meter amenity area. That's something that was initially considered, just given the constraints of the property, the area in which the building occupies of the property. Um, however, as you could see, even on the conceptual plans, there was significant balconies that were proposed on the southernmost portion of that build. Um, and we're working through refinements to that with staff as we, as we proceed through this technical review process to understand what could be reconfigured or considered for amenity, given the definitions of it within the, the current zoning bylaw. 
So they'll have balconies, at least the one on, on the second floor, but uh, they won't have access to green space on the property? Uh, it, within the current plan, there's green space, a green space strip across the northernmost portion of the severed parcel, uh, as well as the southernmost portion of the severed parcel, just uh, fairly tight to the existing build. And you did touch on the active transportation that the city's trying to promote, um, but you're not actually providing any bike parking spaces. Uh, through Mr. Chair, the conceptual plans uh, include bicycle parking on site within the existing building in the garage. Okay, because that wasn't mentioned. Thank you. Um, next page. Um, Within Exhibit D, 1.18, uh, uh, it talks about uh, F, promoting design and orientation which maximizes energy efficiency and co conservation and considers mitigation factors. Um, I'm just wondering what plans are be, going to be taken? Or are you able to answer this? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, with respect to the energy efficiencies of the building, uh, the, the sort of the greening, if you will, of this uh, redevelopment plan, uh, not all the details of it have been completed as we're, again, very somewhat high level with regard to the zoning process as opposed to the build out of the actual units. However, there will be aspects of it that uh, significantly improve the efficiencies of that build, uh, given that it would be built to a standard that's required of, of today as opposed to a uh, a 1900 standard um, and through the introduction of features like uh, heat pumps, uh, air source heat pumps, et cetera, that I would suspect would be included but, but only to be determined at times of future build out, those would be considerations that could be applicable to achieving the policies of the city, uh, city's official plan of, of 2-1-1. Thank you, because I think you just uh, wandered into my next question. Um, under the same exhibit 2.1.4a, the encouragement of green building design to reduce greenhouse gases by adopting either energy efficient construction, renewable sources of energy for lighting and heating, natural lighting. So is there any further you would like to add to that? Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I would reiterate much of my, my answer from the previous comment, uh, Councillor, to that point in, in that really understanding how those uh, features, from example, of, of protecting uh, sunshade and understanding where the solar efficiencies would be, would come at, at time of detailed design, um, as opposed to at this stage of the process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other counselors who would like to ask questions about the severing of this lot? Okay, seeing none, we will adjourn this public meeting and move on to the next one. This is the non, thank you guys. So uh, non-statutory public meeting, we will have a staff will provide some information. Miss Laura Flattery. Oh, okay, Mr. Barr. All right, good to go? All right. Absolutely, you got all night if you need to. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Uh, complicated discussion tonight, but hopefully we can make this as clear as possible. So good evening, everyone. My name is James Barr. I'm the Manager of Development Approvals with the City. And tonight we're here to talk about proposed changes we're making to our processes under the Planning Act, given a lot of provincial legislation changes which will impact our daily business. Uh, tonight I have with me Laura Flaherty, who's our project manager, who's been working uh, in hand with us on this specific key point, as well as Tim Park, who is the director of planning services. This topic is not an easy one, uh, but we're hoping to make this as clear as possible tonight, and we will be ready to answer any of your questions. The main crux of tonight 
and its presentation is to protect the public interest and continue to make good decisions on Planning Act applications. Tonight's meeting forms one part of our public consultation process because we have had conversations with our development community, with the Kingston Home Builders Association, and members of the public who frequently engage on Planning Act applications. Post tonight as well, we'll be speaking with all of our internal departments at our part of technical review to run these process changes by them. And we have had contact with the directors of the organization for the city uh, who have been briefed on some of these changes as well. The final step in all of this is we'll be bringing a report forward to council at the end of June uh, in order to bring forward the finalized and, and fully realized conception of the Planning Act changes. So where do we start? How do we unpack this complicated process? We had to ask ourselves questions about exactly what we were trying to do when we're thinking about making changes to our processes. So we put together five guiding principles to help frame the discussion around this. The first one was find efficiencies in the process. We think it's a good idea to always ask ourselves periodically, is this the best way we're doing business? The culmination of that is, a couple points that we're gonna talk about tonight, but we think we found some efficiencies in our process, whether the changes are implemented or not um, from the provincial level, that will actually help speed up our processing of development applications. The first is to maintain, or sorry, the second is to maintain the public interest uh, and public input in what we're doing. Right now, our current process has two public touch points, which are the main public touch points, being the public meeting report and the comprehensive report. As of 2017, both of those are areas where members of the public can show up to planning committee and ask questions and participate in the process. And we want to make sure that those two public touch points are maintained even with the changes, and we'll detail those further tonight. The third is to deliver on technical review. We realize that we want to be and continue to be partners in development with our development community and support the iterative process that results in the best possible development outcomes for the community. So we want to ensure that the primacy of technical review, which is one of the key points of processing a development application to make sure that it is functional and supportable, is maintained. The third is to ensure clarity in the process. We realize that the current processing of development applications can be big, some people might find it convoluted, but it is the process that we operate within on a daily basis. So we want to utilize the existing tools that we have, um, as well as, so the existing tool would be something like Dash and the processing of applications, uh, but also to develop a series of images, of reporting, and of presentations in order to present this in the most cohesive way we possibly can. And the fifth is to be fiscally responsible. As we have estimated in previous reports and brought forward to this council, there is over $500,000 in the current budget that would be subject to fee refunds uh, should all of them be enacted upon. That is a large portion of our budget, and uh, as was recently pointed out today by a councillor in a Global News interview, could represent a 1% tax increase on the budget just to support the processing of development applications. Uh, additionally, changes were also made to the Ontario Land Tribunal Act, which enforces a stronger loser pays principle. So what we also wanted to avoid was, uh, was uh, prematurely denying development application because we weren't able to complete the technical review in an appropriate manner, which could result in greater appeals to the Ontario Land Tribunal and a greater strain on the tax base. The aim of this all is to maintain the submitted fees and refund as little as possible. We realize there are no guarantees in the process, even processing applications today, but we want to ensure that we're doing the best that we can to balance all of these five key objectives and bring forward a process that allows us to appropriately uh, process development applications and continue to work with our development community. So we have two potentials both of which are still in play right now because there are amendments moving forward through the Ontario legislature, uh, which haven't gotten third reading yet. 
And potential one is that Kingston is subject to fee refunds, where the legislation's passed and as of Jan or sorry, as of July 1st of 2023, zoning bylaw amendments and site plan control applications that do not meet the specified processing timelines will be subject to fee refunds. There is an Ontario regulation that's proposed that the minister has the ability to uh, waive fee refunds for app for municipalities that are subject to that list. So there's a possibility that the minister might be able to add municipalities to that and that we wouldn't be subject to fee refunds even when the legislation comes into place, which is potential number two. So we reviewed these both in great detail in the report and we're gonna unpack tonight in the presentation both of these potentials as we move through the process changes. So what we have before us here is the diagram that we've done our best to put forward a visual that represents our current development process for zoning bylaw amendments and site plan control applications. These start with pre-application, which has a host of technical review and reporting that comes out of it. Once an applicant has successfully gone through pre-application, they can move through a rezoning application, then forward to a site plan control application and a building permit. Not every application follows this exact process, but for the purposes of tonight, we're gonna review an application that would go through this process in detail to really highlight the changes that we're making. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time unpacking all the bills that have gone through or are currently going through the legislator at this time, but I want to point out that the changes the province has made are being done without, within the existing operating framework of the Planning Act meaning that municipalities have been given no new tools in order to speed up the processing of applications. It's also assumed that we're the only ones responsible for the timeline of processing applications. The legislation that's currently out there ignores the importance of every individual step of the process and instead looks to just one, which is the overall timeline. We can't, as a municipality, change the legislation. So the process changes we are proposing here tonight aim to make up for the oversights in the legislation, since each step is important to making sound planning recommendations. All changes here proposed tonight are done with the current operating parameters of the Planning Act. Which, just in detail looking at this slide, so if July 1st comes around, uh, we are in the process of understanding that we'll be refunding potentially 50% of uh, an application's fees if they're not processed within the current timeline. Um, if they then hit the next marker, which is a certain specified number of days out, we're looking at a 75% refund or 100 if they reach that final marker, which are all legislated under the Planning Act. So for a zoning bylaw amendment, which we're supposed to process in 90 days with the current legislation, if we do not have an act, a, a recommendation on that application within 90 days, um, we're subject to the 50% fee refund, and it's automatic. There is no ability for someone to waive the requirement for fee refunds. It becomes an automatic requirement that we have to refund. If that zoning bylaw amendment still doesn't have a decision on it in 150 days, it is subject to a 75% refund, and 210 days plus, we're into a 100% fee refund. Just to give you an indication, looking at this current slide, we've averaged out that we process a zoning bylaw amendment in its current format, at about 235 days, which puts us in a significant uh, bracket for refunding almost 100% of development applications for that specific type. This is a tracked changes version of all of the recommendations that we're gonna be talking about tonight under the potential for one. So under potential fund where we're subject under potential one, we are, we are subject to fee refunds. This is that track changes version. I'm gonna unpack this piece by piece so we don't have to worry about talking about this in great detail right now, but just to give you an overview of where we're gonna go tonight. For potential number two, this is the track changes version as well. You can see that there are fewer track changes versions with this one um, because we are proposing less changes if we're not subject to fee refunds because we don't have to worry about sheltering fees as aggressively as we would, but we are still finding efficiencies within the process that will help speed up development applications, help actually bring them quicker to a planning committee for initial public input, and help reduce administrative burden when it comes to report writing, which will also allow us to focus more staff time on the processing of applications. 
So the first proposed, uh, for proposed change one, which is outlined in the staff report as the initial public meeting, for both potentials one and two, our current process is that we have a public meeting report and then we move towards a comprehensive report. We're proposing changing the statutory requirement because currently both the public meeting report and the comprehensive report satisfy the statutory requirements under the Planning Act as a public meeting. So we're currently hosting two statutory public meetings. The idea is that we would change the first one to a community meeting to remove the confusion around the lingo about it as well because what we're really doing is we're engaging the community first in that initial public meeting. We're trying to get as much information out as we possibly can in order for the public to understand a change that is proposed. The community meeting report would be a bit more high level. It would contain all the necessary information a member of the public or committee would need in order to understand a proposal that's come forward. But we would consolidate numerous community meetings into one staff report that would come from the manager of development approvals outlining what's currently proposed to get that information out to the public as expeditiously as possible. What this also does is it removes about 35 days from the uh, application processing timeline, which is the amount of time and energy and days that goes into creating and reviewing a report in order to get it to planning committee. That's staff time that can be better utilized on the processing of a development application. Under potential one only, zoning bylaw amendment pre-applications would be subject to a community meeting. The community meeting uh, required uh, to complete the zoning bylaw amendment uh, would just be the statutory public meeting. So once we make a recommendation, the community meeting notice, we will do our best to achieve the statutory requirements to let people know as soon as possible that an application has been submitted. So that's 20 days out from an application. But in order to get that as expeditiously as we can on a meeting, some days it might be a little less than 20, just depending on the submission timeline and the, the day the public meeting is coming up. We're also proposing to utilize a listserv, like a more modern piece of technology, where members of the public can sign up for uh, notices from the planning department and receive direct into email inboxes, notices of uh, upcoming public meetings and of community meetings. Under potential two, we will remain um, keeping the pre-application as it currently is, uh, and the community meeting will be scheduled as early as possible to make that information available. This option we're currently open to feedback on as there may be potential benefits to pulling the community meeting into the zoning bylaw amendment pre-app, which is what I'm gonna detail in the next slide. Uh, so we're open to receiving comments on this key piece. The community meeting notice will also be the same as the current uh, public meeting notice. As I mentioned, we're gonna go through these piece by piece. So anything that's highlighted in red right now is the change that we're talking about. Anything grayed out is not happening. So if you look under the zoning and site plan control pre-app, those initial public meetings will be uh, crossed out and they're actually moved to the zoning bylaw amendment pre-application stage where we'll host that community meeting. The benefits of this I'm going to get into in a minute once we get into the second portion of this, but I think it's a really key point that we would actually be front-ending more public consultation earlier in a process uh, rather than having an applicant prepare everything, submit a complete application, and then start to receive public input. Under potential two, same process, but what we would do is still keep it within the actual rezoning application rather than front-ending it into a pre-application and the public meeting report would be changed to a community meeting report. So we still look to get this out as soon as possible. It just wouldn't be in a pre-consultation format. Proposed change number two is to change pre-application as we currently note it. Our standard pre-application that we currently operate is a confidential process. Applicants are able to submit a development concept, have it reviewed by the city, and get comments on it in order to proceed with a complete application. We have already started to make changes to the pre-application process by introducing a major and a minor development, uh, sorry, application fee uh, to really recognize the work that goes into the different application types. Even though we're changing the pre-application process, we do not want to remove that initial touch base with the developer if they wanted to submit a confidential pre-application prior to moving into a zoning bylaw amendment pre-application or site plan control pre-application. So that step will still be there. But 
if we're looking at option one, where we're subject to fee refunds, where we're going to be going through possibly a confidential pre-app, the zoning bylaw amendment pre-app, and then the actual application, we're looking at aligning it with our current review cycles. So someone commit for a zoning, someone could submit for a zoning bylaw amendment pre-application, which is not confidential. It would be subject to a six-week cycle, so there would be defined parameters on when we would turn information around to them. And there would be an initial fee with that as well, which is $2,000. But $1,000 of that would be credited towards a future application. Within the zoning bylaw amendment pre-application as well, because technical review can take a couple cycles and we don't really have the time to process that now under 90 days within the new proposed timelines for an actual zoning bylaw amendment application, we would allow an applicant to submit multiple technical reviews through that zoning bylaw amendment pre-application. Every time they would submit, it's an additional $1,000 charge, but we're not looking to you know, adversely impact an application by increasing their fees exponentially for technical review. So every one of those pre-application submissions that cost $1,000 would be credited towards their future application. The same applies for a site plan control pre-application. So we would essentially be front-ending more technical review prior to an actual application to make sure that both our internal partners and the applicants have enough time to respond to technical review in order to make a project supportable, feasible, and that we are uh, processing this as quickly as possible. So looking at the proposed change two, which is the change for pre-application under option one, we would first go to, on the left-hand side under the yellow column, the zoning bylaw amendment pre-application, which would be post-confidential pre-application should an applicant choose this route. And then after they're through the technical review of their zoning bylaw amendment pre-application, we would move to a actual rezoning application. One of the big changes that we're gonna to have to undertake if we're subject to fee refunds is not processing actual applications concurrently because that becomes very difficult where a site plan control application tends to take longer than the 60 days required. We would be looking at front ending that review. So when someone submits for an actual zoning bylaw amendment act application under the Planning Act, we would allow them to submit their site plan control pre-application. So there is a level of concurrent applications being processed at the same time. But it wouldn't be like today where someone would submit their uh, zoning bylaw amendment and site plan control application under the planning act to be processed concurrently. It'd be a two-step process. So looking forward to the site plan control application, once their zoning bylaw amendment is approved, they would be able to submit for the actual site plan control application under the planning act because the basis of land use is established. And we need that in order to actually approve a site plan control application because they have to conform to the zoning bylaw. So it's a multi-step process to make sure that we're still reviewing applications, but processing them within the appropriate timelines in order to shelter as many fees as we possibly can. If you look at the bottom of all of these charts as well, we have anticipated days associated with it. So the six-week cycle that we would run for zoning bylaw amendment pre-applications would be around 42 days with only one technical review. Uh, if you look here, we I don't know if you can actually see my the cursor on this, it looks like you can. So we would process it as we normally would, but anywhere you see a circular arrow like this, opportunities exist for multiple circulations. So someone could process something in the six week timeline, or if they want additional technical review, they have that option to keep resubmitting in order to make their application as sound as possible once they move forward with their actual application. Proposed change three, is changing recommendations. So before an application's time frame runs out, we would either recommend refusal, approval, or a modified approval based on what staff support given the application material is. A deadline through technical review would be established to submit revised materials in the first technical review for a zoning bylaw amendment application, so within that 90-day parameter. Otherwise, a recommendation will be made on that first submission. So what that could mean is if someone submitted to development with 10 units and of a certain size, maybe staff can only support a unit count of six there based on the technical parameters of it. If we're into a modified approval, even though they've submitted for 10, we might be in a scenario where staff would put forward a recommendation to approve six, 
and then the developer would have the option to either um, appeal to the council or planning committee at the public meeting that they're asked or potentially to the Ontario Land Tribunal. So it puts us in a bit of a different scenario than what we're typically used to by modifying an approval uh, where the applicant might not be on side with what uh, we're recommending based on what they've submitted. Where this proposed change would happen in the change recommendation period is under a, a rezoning application. So looking down, we would normally recommend uh, through the comprehensive report a recommendation. That would give us the ability to recommend either approval, refusal, or the modified approval. Proposed change four in the report talks about creating a withdrawal fee. So within that first technical review that we would undertake for a zoning bylaw amendment application where we establish that deadline, if you do not submit revised drawings by X date, we'll move forward with a recommendation. The other option is if you do not submit by the X date that's established in technical review, you can also as an applicant re uh, request to withdraw your application. What that means is the applicant would forfeit their standard fees, the ones that they've paid, in favor of a lower fee to submit their next complete application. So we wouldn't be looking to double charge for a zoning bylaw amendment application. We would establish a nominal resubmission fee to restart that technical review of that same application after it's been withdrawn. There'd be no need for an applicant to submit immediately following their withdrawal. They would be able to take the time in order to respond to the technical review comments prior to resubmitting and re-engaging that application. There would be a new notice of uh, complete application associated with that, so members of the public would be aware once that submission has been uh, completed in DASH and is ready for review again. As I've noted, that nominal fee is gonna be a $1,000 fee as well to cover the administrative costs of starting up the application, including the notices associated with it. Where this falls in the process is under the rezoning and site plan control approval process, so column two in teal. So after a complete application is made and technical review is undertaken, a deadline for the application to withdraw or make a revised submission would be established. Proposed change five places more onus on the applicant. So where an application would be technically more dense than some applications, it would require more upfront, or up for, upfront information to be submitted by the application. So that could involve an open house that's made a requirement of the submission of a complete application where a member of the public would be able to attend an open house held by the developer um, on the proposal that they're looking to submit for an application. And then when they go to submit their complete application with the city, they would have to have a record of that uh, meeting in order to have their application be deemed complete to show that they've had that initial upfront open house. Additionally, for applications that require greater peer review, they would be required to submit a pre-peer reviewed application. So they would have their consultant prepare the initial report. They would work with the city to establish a peer reviewer and that peer reviewer would review that and develop their report to be submitted concurrently with the complete application requirements. And then for site plan control, we would require zoning compliance. What that looks like is a site plan control application under the Planning Act couldn't be submitted until their zoning was approved. So that really puts a lot more emphasis on getting the zoning approved in order to get to that next step, which is site plan control. What that looks like here in terms of the processing timelines for column number three in red under site plan control, site plan control would no longer be concurrent with a zoning bylaw amendment application, it would have to be a separate and distinct process. Proposed change number six requires us to deem more applications incomplete. So not only will we be looking to deem applications incomplete um, if they're missing submission material information, but also if content is missing from those reports where they don't meet the city's technical standards, terms of references, they would be deemed incomplete and the developer would be uh, forced to go back and review and update their reports in order for their application to be deemed complete. This 
process of deeming an application incomplete is also subject to appeal at the Ontario Land Tribunal. So if, if an applicant is of the mind that they've submitted everything that they are required to, they could technically appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal, but we're hoping that that is not a scenario that people would want to be involved in and that we would move forward with an actual technical review with updated studies to meet those submission requirements. Looking at the proposed change chart here, it actually impacts both column two and column three, which is the rezoning application and site plan control application up front. So where we're deeming applications complete, it would have us deem um, complete applications incomplete more frequently. What we do want to avoid though is um, while an application might be missing information, we would not deem an application incomplete if we disagree with some of the information in it or if there are technical pieces that need to be now, further review through technical review. So there is a fine nuance balance here when deeming an application incomplete. Proposed change number seven is conditional site plan approval. The old processing timeline under the Planning Act for site plan control used to be 30 days before a developer could appeal for non-decision. Uh, with the changes that were made, it was up to 60 days, which you know was a 100% increase, but isn't actually enough to reflect how uh, we process applications with the city and our average time for processing a site plan control application as we've reviewed it over the past five years is 300 days. But that is not a number that is separate and distinct from the process because there are nuances with it. We do get concurrent zoning and site plan control applications. So while a zoning amendment is being reviewed, an application for site plan control is also open, which adds to the number of days that that application is open. We can only approve a site plan control application once the zoning is in place. So if a zoning bylaw amendment was processed and took 230 days, technically within the days after that, we'd be able to approve site plan control. So where there's overlapping processes, zoning and site plan control can go hand in hand, uh, but it does skew some of the results of the number of days that it takes for us to process a site plan control application. Looking at proposed change seven chart, the conditional approval is something that would be looking to as part of the implementation of meeting the 60-day requirement. What we do when we currently process site plan control applications is we look for full technical review approval and then develop an agreement. So that usually involves multiple iterations of technical review. This version of site plan control would be a one and done under an application where the actual site plan control application being processed within 60 days uh, would go through a technical review and then they would be issued conditions of approval. So we would conditionally approve a site plan control application but host to a subject of conditions. So that could be updating some certain technical standards, revising drawings and designs, but once a developer meets all of those requirements, they would obtain their approval from the city and be able to build. So the ball will be put back in their court after conditional approval to satisfy all conditions of the city through that one and done process. Recognizing that that's sometimes not enough time for a site plan control application to be reviewed in great detail, uh, we do have the site plan control pre-application, much like the zoning bylaw amendment one that can be submitted prior to a complete application under the Act to allow for additional technical review. Proposed change number eight is also prioritizing official plan amendments and zoning bylaw amendments and site plan control applications. Because these are subject to fee refunds and have definitive timelines, it means that we would be processing these and prioritizing them above a host of other applications that are submitted with the city. That includes minor variances, hold removals, part lock control lifts, um, consent applications. So those host of other applications would be deprioritized in the processing of these um, applications. The unfortunate downside is it may lessen the services associated with these other application types because we are focused on uh, at processing the applications that have those definitive timelines and financial penalties associated with not processing them within their legislated timeframes. So looking at the proposed change chart, that uh, is prioritizing both these application types, so two and three as we move through to process them. Like in the report, this is the summary of the proposed changes that are before us. Um, 
it's a it's a big list of changes that could potentially impact the processing of applications, but they're important to understand in how they impact our daily business. So this is the clean version of non-track changes version of the processing of potential one where we're subject to fee refunds. So we would start with after a confidential pre-application should an applicant choose to do that. On the left, number one, which is the zoning bylaw amendment pre-application, which would be a public facing process, which would have the community meeting associated with it and possibly more than one round of technical review should an applicant choose to proceed that way. The second step to this would be a rezoning application and possibly a submitted uh, concurrent site plan control pre-application where technical review would be undertaken with parameters where we would not have an additional public meeting because that would be handled through the zoning bylaw amendment pre-application and we would proceed after technical review to a comprehensive report uh, where we would bring forward our recommendation. Post approval of a zoning bylaw amendment application and uh, a successful site plan control pre-application, we would move forward with an actual site plan control application, which would be subject to conditional approval. This is all in order to make sure that we're processing column two and column three, so the actual zoning bylaw amendment application and site plan control application within their specified timelines, which is 90 days for rezoning and 60 days for site plan in order to achieve uh, new development through to a building permit process. Proposed process for uh, potential two is more in line with what we currently have, but what it does is it moves that community meeting um, in place of a public meeting report, uh, lessening the amount of time we spend developing that initial uh, public meeting report, but still putting forward all of the details that are required uh, in order for members of the public and committee to understand what's being proposed. The question we ask ourselves at the end is, what happens if we don't make any of these changes? This is commonly known as a do-nothing scenario. And what this would do is remove ourselves from the table where we are partners in the processing of development applications. It would hamper our ability to make good land use planning decisions because we are not affording appropriate time for technical review or public consultation and could result in more lost revenue or decisions that are denial decisions which could put us into Ontario land tribunal hearings which could be an additional burden on the tax base. It would also remove opportunities for public participation. Fee refunds and more appeals in Ontario land tribunal hearings um, are not a scenario that we want to end up in where we are uh, putting more tax base money at risk and also risking not good land use planning decisions. There is no guarantee in this process as we're moving through this and we are open to uh, comments, questions on the proposed changes that we're putting forward, but thinking back to the five objectives we put together, uh, the changes that we're making uh, in our opinion, effectively balance those to make sure that we are still processing applications as we are used to at the city and making sure that all technical data has been appropriately reviewed and approved as part of them. So I know we've unpacked a lot here tonight. I'm gonna stand up here at the podium to answer any questions. If we need to go back to a slide to specifically reference it, I'm happy to do so. And my colleague, Laura, is also joining me for the question period. Thank you. I know I wrote down five questions and you answered four of them right away, so uh, <laughs> that was outstanding. Thank you. Um, just quickly before we get to the committee, may I ask, are, um, assuming the best case scenario of option one or proposal one, uh, is there any way that the, um, an unscrupulous um, developer might be able to drag their feet and demand their money back? I missed the last part of that, but I heard uh, demand money back. I, if you can just clarify what the... Sorry. If, um, is it possible for an unscrupulous developer to drag their feet with any one of the steps that are still being changed such that the time runs out and they get their money back? Yeah, that's a great question. That is 100% a possibility. What we're trying to do is set up this process to make ourselves as available uh, to and open to our development community who wants to work with us to process these applications. A developer could very well submit for a site plan control application 
uh, sorry, a zoning bylaw amendment application after they go through their pre-application processes and really try to push it through the 90-day window to get a decision quicker. What that would do is either have them wait and get their fees back. It might force us to consider whether we change a recommendation and bring something forward that we can support based on that application. Or it might actually have us hold and process the application as we normally would and refund the fees because we see the benefit in bringing it forward. Um, that scenario is one that we have talked about. It's one that we're open to because if we, again, prematurely make a decision on an application to deny or modify, we're still opening ourselves up to an Ontario land tribunal hearing. So in being fiscally responsible and making good land use planning decisions, there might be scenarios where we have to contemplate refunding fees in order to save ourselves from an appeal of non-decision or a decision that a developer doesn't like, which could cost us more money in the long run at an Ontario land tribunal hearing. Thank you. So, comments and questions from the public. You have up to five minutes. Go ahead, Frank. Um, Frank Dixon, 485 Alfred, Apartment 2, K7K, 4J4. Um, thank you, Mr. Barr, for uh, your presentation. Um, clearly, an enormous amount of work has gone into this. You covered a uh, wide range of topics. I've actually got some stuff from maybe outside what you uh, were covering, but I think it's all still relevant. Um, and I've written it down, so this will help the clerk uh, get it on the record. So my first uh, question is dealing with, say, a specific problematic case. Uh, it's the former grain elevator site on King Street West just on the border between Portsmouth and um, the other district there is um, Lakeside. It's on um, a pier which used to contain uh, an elevator. And there are uncollected fees owed the city in a six figure amount, as I understand it, from the 1990s, which are owed by a former developer who put forward a proposal and city staff worked on it and then they walked away from it. Now there's a new developer uh, has taken on the site and they've been told by the fire and rescue that the site is basically unserviceable because getting in there and getting out is very difficult. It's a long, narrow site. It's a long ways from the access. So yet there is pre-sales for the, the new proposal are in process before any new planning application has been submitted, much less approved. So how is that possible? It seems to be convoluted beyond belief and the system is being gamed. And how does the city ever recover that money? So that's question number one. Question number two is more on the general side in terms of a definition of developer from the standpoint of professionalization compared to recognized professions such as lawyer, engineer, doctor, planner, architect, nurse, accountant, and dentist, to name a few. And all these professions have provincially established governing bodies which regulate ethics, membership, and so forth to establish standards and maintain public confidence. It seems virtually anyone can call themselves a developer in Ontario with which privileges and which responsibilities? So I know you're probably not prepared to answer that, but I wanted to get it on the record because I've been thinking about this for quite a while and this seems to be a reasonable uh, place to raise it. Now, question number three, um, how much of the delays which occur on planning applications in the city of Kingston is as a result of insufficient planning staff availability? And I raise this point, um, following up uh, Paige Agnew's presentation to a 2019 meeting of the Mayor's Task Force on Housing, where she raised this vitally important aspect in substantial detail. So planners leave, they're being hired back in, uh, there's a shortage of planners, um, and, and so forth. The, the number of applications you're dealing with, their complexity, um, appeals that are going on and so forth, right? So um, clearly it takes many years to train a planner. 
Um, there's enormous amount of um, material to, to master there. And the city, I think, is, I mean, I've been to dozens of these meetings. My impression is the effort is there. You know, the high degree of, uh, uh, of being professional is there. You're interacting with the public. You're, you're making the effort. You're talking to council. You're doing all these things. Yet, sometimes we're still defeated on getting projects up, uh, approved or processed in time just due to a shortage of staff. So those are my points, and um, thank you again uh, for, for the work. So I'll just pass these to the clerk. Thank you. Is there anyone else? No one else online. No one else online. Okay. Mr. Barr, are you prepared to answer these? I am prepared to answer these as best as I can right now. So thank you, uh, through you, Chair, and to the member of the public, thank you for the questions tonight. I understand that you've handed uh, them to the clerk as well. Um, more dense than I could read right now, but I'm gonna answer as best I can from what I heard, and then we can always follow up uh, post this meeting if I have not answered them sufficiently. I think the first one with regards to an application that has been ongoing for a while is the elevator bay proposal out in the uh, west end along the water. Um, that application actually has zoning from the 70s. I'm unsure about unpaid bills associated with it because we just went through an approvals process for site plan control on it. Uh, so they actually do have approvals from the city to proceed um, with conditions because they have a number of conditions to work through with the conservation authority. So I'd be happy to follow up uh, after this to walk you through that um, key piece of approval that's already happened. The second one relates to ethics uh, with the, I guess, capital D developer and, and who calls themselves a developer. Um, you're right, I think numbers, a wide variety of people could be considered a developer based on what they're developing. And I believe it is more of an umbrella term to encapsulate either applicants in a development process or call themselves developers if they're doing multi-properties. I'm unsure of any sort of ethical board that would regulate and govern the oversight of those key people, but it is worthy to note that uh, professional planners, so people representing applications that go through this process, are subject to a standard of code and practices as well as ethics from the Canadian Institute of Planners and the Ontario Professional Planners Institute as they operate in Ontario. Uh, so representatives like myself on the public side and those on the private side uh, both of us are subject to the same code of ethics to represent as best we can the applicant and the applications as they move through the process. Engineers are also subject to their code of ethics and professionalism as well. Uh, so there are a host of professionals within the uh, development community that are all subject to governing bodies, codes of ethics and professionalism. I'm gonna to defer to Mr. Park to talk about uh, point three, which I believe was the, the staffing consideration. So I'll look to Director Park for that. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Barr. Um, I think the reference being made going back to 2019 and the statement made by uh, uh, Commissioner Agnew about the staffing levels and planning were probably relating to the time in around uh, you know the 2018-2019 period. And definitely at that time, there was a, a large staff turnover uh, in the management area as well as the planner area. Um, I actually uh, came in in partway through 2019 and uh, at that point we started aggressively uh, pursuing planners to fill those positions and we have continued that to this date. Uh, we've actually added new positions to our complement and I can report at this time with the exception of one position in the department, we are fully staffed. So we are running basically at 98% right now in terms of our staffing capacity. So from the time Ms. Agnew made that statement until now, uh, we have fulfilled that staffing obligation and brought in uh, numerous new staff and replaced uh, people that were uh, left as a result of moving on to other jobs. Thank you. Outstanding, thank you. Okay, I see Councillor Oosterhoff's hand and then Councillor Osanek. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Um, really, I um, want to commend staff for this report, and uh, I, I agree this is a lot. Um, 
to digest, really, but um, I am always impressed. So um, <clears throat> it's a lot for us for counselors to dig at, too. So, but thank you for the opportunity. And um, I don't, I guess um, we always seem to struggle, um, I'm sure you agree, with, with regula regulatory uh, in the real world. That's what most of us work under. And so I guess you're saying that the regulations have made it difficult. and. Uh, for us as a planning uh, department. And so I just wanted to, you know, because everything is about integrity in our work. And so um, is that when we use the words like, you know, when we want to not not give a refund, is that is that like, you know, the one thing that you're told can't happen? And so that's why we're being strategic. Is it, are, are you guys comfortable with that so that we don't get uh, flagged as, as, as being uh, uh, not fair. And I, I just wondering how, how you struggled with that. Like when you give like 0.7 and six or whatever it was, uh, incomplete and conditional uh, labeling of a file. And um, uh, how, how can we sure that it's fair for you guys, but also fair for the applicant in in, 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 a, in a honest application kind of thing, you know, uh, everything's there. Thanks and through you, Chair. That's a question that we've batted around pretty significantly when we're thinking about this process because we want to be partners in development in the city. We, uh, we want to encourage it. We want good development to come forward. We want to bring forward sound recommendations. And we don't want to unfairly penalize anybody. We don't want to un uh, unfairly penalize ourselves in this process as well. So we're really trying to balance the objectives of making sure that applicants know the process, that they understand the process, that they're partners with us in this as well, uh, so that uh, when we do bring forward a recommendation, which we're, we, we've talked about before and we've been really successful in doing and getting applications modified and bringing them forward to, uh, to, to committee, to council, with a recommendation to approve because we want this development. Um, when we're talking about not refunding fees, it's, it's the opposite side of the balance where we also don't want to unfairly impugn the tax base because the Planning Act allows us to do cost recovery through the fees that we charge for applications. Um, so it, it's really, it, it, it's a plate that we're holding that has seven or eight balls in it that we're trying to balance to make sure that, that nothing tips over there. Um, and really, I think the, the process that we're putting forward tonight is a really great culmination of trying to balance all those objectives to make sure that we're clear that we're concise and that we're not unfair in the processing of these applications. I'm gonna look to my colleague, Ms. Flaherty, as well to see if she has anything additional to add. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barr. I think uh, you covered the, uh, you covered really, really well. I would also just add from a fairness perspective, um, there are an, a lot of applicants and developers who enjoy collaborating with us to get to, you know, a positive recommend recommendation that results in a good development for the community. So a lot of the changes that we're making are also giving them the opportunity to continue to collaborate with us without unfairly having to make premature refusal recommendations. So from that perspective as well, it's just ensuring that we have the ability to continue that collaborative dialogue as well. Yeah, thank you um, through the chair um, for those answers. And I, I do believe that, I do believe that that's really true. And so the gift to early will be in, the, in the, every file is that is the power of communication and uh, making it really clear before the class, the clock starts ticking. And, um, and I, I like the expression of partnership. I mean, um, I think that that is make the effort ought to be for a win-win situation, and then we could, um, you know, set a maybe. Maybe this will set a new tomorrow that you know that that projects will get done either quicker or approved quicker, or you know we have better 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 results. So I'm 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 optimistic about that. But um, I guess it would also be probable that the world, you know, planners are a professional planners, like similar to the presentation tonight, you know. Um, you know that they're, they're going to become quite necessary. Would you would you agree to to be able to follow this process? 
Thanks, interview chair. Uh, sorry, Councillor Oosterhoff. I think I missed the question in that. If you could just. Uh, yeah, no, I guess I, I guess would you agree that ha hiring a professional professional planner for most uh, developments? Uh, I mean, uh, that that's going to become incredibly necessary so that uh, you have that cooperation, but also that that, that level of uh, understanding of what's trying to be accomplished within the timelines and and having success in that file. Through you, chair. The vast majority of applications that you see that come forward to committee are supported by a professional planner on the private side as well. Uh, zoning bylaw amendments, we do require a planning justification report prepared by a qualified professional. And in our line of work, that is a registered professional planner. Uh, so applications are often, if not always, supported by that objective level of review coming in to support that application. There are instances and scenarios where we do not require a professional planner's recommendation. Those are typically smaller applications, like through the committee of adjustment, where someone might be increasing the size of their deck or severing a parcel of land that's very straightforward. And we don't want to unfairly burden them with the financial cost of hiring that professional when the application is very straightforward. Yeah, thank you. And through the chair, I appreciate that reply because that's exactly where I was going. There is a balance of where you can, and I appreciate you speaking to that uh, to that consideration so the last question i just wrote down uh, quickly mr chair through the chair is you know again do we because of the regulation i guess what we're hoping is that we don't uh fall or you know for the expression you know haste makes waste like because uh timelines are so rigid you know uh, i guess everyone's really got to do their jobs fairly quickly and uh do we run the risk of 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 approving or even maybe disapproving too too quickly and and how do we guard against that by saying no too quickly or maybe yes too quickly and being brought to council and and i guess that's why you've brought these processes so that we won't do that but have you grappled with that too through you chair that's a great question and one that is front of mind for us we do not want to end up in a scenario where we're compromising the city's position uh, when we're processing these development applications we want to make sure that these are technically sound, which is why we've opened up this multi-step process to allow for early pre-consultation, to allow for early technical submissions, to have those reviewed uh, in order to arrive at a quicker decision in the actual legislated timeframe once we get to a zoning bylaw amendment application or site plan control application. I think that it's an important part of the process and one that we've consulted on with the development community and that they seem to be open to. Uh, they understand the scenario that we're all in as professional planners processing applications in, in Ontario at this time. And a lot of the professionals that we work with work multi-jurisdictionally across the province. So they're seeing the other changes that are coming in in other municipalities. Um, this is not a, a Kingston only scenario. This is an Ontario wide scenario currently. And we're putting forward these process changes to make sure that we as a city have solid footing to make good recommendations in order to get the development that we want in the city. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Mr. Chair, can I have one more question? Um, on the fees, um, I just, um, it's always obviously it's 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 big money very quickly for for everyone applicants and and, and the costing are we um, do we do we justify that and, and com use comparable to same size like uh, municipalities and um, is there there's there's um, work <laughs> there's data involved when we 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 establish those those numbers there is data through you chair there is data involved in the numbers that we have put forward for our development applications. I believe there was a Watson review done a number of years ago that looked at our cost recovery on applications. At that time, we did make significant changes to a number of our applications and then started to index them that they went up annually in order to remain competitive and cover the costs of as much as possible of the department. I am currently speaking with other uh, development approval managers across the province and we are comparing fees that we're charging and whether or not we've changed some of them as a result of the bills that have come forward that are impacting our process. What I can say right now is that everybody has done a lot of work to change their pre-application processes and fees associated with that. Um, that is a common theme we've seen across Ontario. So in, uh, having those upfront pre-applications, those zoning bylaw amendment pre-applications, which are a precursor to the actual zoning bylaw amendment application. In terms of our 
other fees, we are comparable, if not maybe slightly lower than some municipalities of a like size in Kingston. But it's something that we've been working towards as greater cost recovery, but not in a scenario where we will create a jump in fees that could be a shock to applicants and dissuade certain applications. So there's a balance that comes with, you know, our fees that we look at annually and charge annually. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the answers, but also for the dialogue. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sanek. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Uh, thanks very much for all this information and for the um, explanation. So um, for the changes that are proposed, like I really like change five and six and, and even seven. And I know um, there were examples even before this legislation and everything that came from November 2022 onward where, um, you know, like uh, the changes in five and six were needed for some applications, you know, that we had seen earlier. So those those will be good changes. Um, do we know, like, staff came up with these changes themselves, right? Do we know what changes the other municipalities are proposing to their councils to try to, you know, like, better abide by the tight timelines that come into effect in July? Thanks, and through you, Chair, this is going to be a two-parter, so I'll answer the information that I have on this process change and look to Ms. Flaherty because we've both been doing deep work into this. Um, I will say one common theme that has come up across uh, large municipalities, especially municipalities of our size or larger, is the idea of conditional site plan control approval. Um, two municipalities have really led the charge on that way before the province changed their timeframes, that being Toronto and Hamilton. They've had a lot of success with conditional approvals of site plan control. So we've looked to some of their processes in order to understand how it's done to make it implementable for the city. And it's one that I've seen a lot of development managers propose across the province. The second part to this is the idea of having an application that's public facing that involves technical review before the submission of their complete zoning bylaw amendment or site plan control application, which, which has a variety of names across different municipalities. Some call it enhanced pre-application. Some specify that it's a you know, public-facing pre-application, but we're calling it a zoning bylaw amendment pre-application and site plan control because it's specific to those applications. But that is a common theme we've seen as well, where municipalities are looking to, and we're doing it less so than others, but shelter a lot more fee through the pre-application process with much higher pre-application fees than what we would currently be charging but recognizing that they do get a credit in the city of Kingston if we implement these changes against their future uh, zoning bylaw amendment pre-application. But what it also helps to do is, for us, it helps to shelter those fees under pre-application should a developer decide to proceed in a manner that would either force the fee refund discussion or an alternative recommendation discussion. Ms. Flaherty, do you have anything additional to add to that given your research on the topic? Uh, thanks, Mr. Barr. I think you've you've covered uh, generally what I've seen as well from other municipalities. I think the city of Hamilton did a pretty comprehensive review. They had actually hired an external consultant to complete the review of their development review process, and they actually went in a direction of you know hiring a number of new planning staff to really um, help accelerate their development review process. So I think it, through their review, it was identified that in addition to actual process changes, they needed to hire the staff. And I think we've we've considered that and reviewed that internally and um, the the changes that we're proposing we feel you know still align with the staffing complement that we have and it, that would not be a necessary uh, proposed change that we are bringing forward at this point in time thank you uh, through you mr. chair then my last question is like um, whenever there's an application that involves um, a woodland right like a significant like uh, <laughs> any type of woodland, whatever, I always write, go right to the environmental impact studies, right? Like the EIA, um, EIS, whatever the developer calls it at the time. And um, so with these changes, um, the public would still be able to review the EIS before the final comprehensive plan. Um, like where does an EIS fit into these changes? 
through you, Chair, the process changes that we're proposing today uh, would not impact the public's ability to review studies associated with an application. So if someone's doing a comprehensive zoning bylaw amendment application, we might require, depending on the level of environmental significance, that environmental impact study as a requirement of the submission for the zoning bylaw amendment pre-application, but also as part of the actual zoning bylaw amendment application. We do have a different process now to review environmental impact statements because the Conservation Authority can no longer support us on the review of that given the changes that were made to the Conservation Authorities Act. So what we've done is we've rostered uh, two professional firms to who are on retainer essentially to review EISs when they come in so that we can turn around comments on those studies within our specified technical review timeframe so that there is no lag in the review of those applications. However, if the environmental impact could be large and significant, the other option, which falls under option five, Councillor Osanic, which is more onus on the applicants, could require them to submit both the study and a peer review of that study for the city's review to ensure that all technical standards have been met as part of their application. So we will be getting two pieces of information on those EISs, which would be the first is the actual report submitted uh, by the applicant's consultants and a peer review that is um, consulted on with the city in order to choose that person and move forward with that additional level of technical review in detail. Thank you. And my very last question is, um, what's been the feedback with the development community? Like no one is here tonight from the public um, that I see um, to give any feedback. So obviously the city's met with them separate. Is that right? Like you've had separate meeting with all the developers and what's their feedback on uh, what you're presenting tonight? Thanks, and through you, Chair, this might be a three-part answer because I know myself, Ms. Flaherty, and Mr. Park have had conversations with the development community on this, but we have met with the Kingston Home Builders Association to detail the changes that we're making to this process. We have had reached out and had uh, separate discussions with uh, other members of the development community where we've given them a presentation like this. We've actually, I think, done this several times, and Ms. Flaherty can run through that in greater detail um, to talk about these changes, and it has evolved a lot since the initial conception of what we've put together based on a lot of feedback that we received from our development community. So the process that you see here tonight is friendly amended as we've gone through this because we've built it with them. We've built it kind of with our development community to make sure that they are partners in the development uh, process that we're putting forward. I'm gonna turn it over to Director Park and then we'll look to uh, Ms. Flaherty for additional uh, information here. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Barr. I just wanted to add to Mr. Barr's uh, statements. Uh, we also did reach out to uh, the, the public, the community, to have discussions around these changes. So we also re re um, received feedback from them. We did the same sort of presentation to them that we did with the development community. So they were aware of this, uh, their, their general comments, I think, that we got back from them, and I think Ms. Flaherty or Mr. Barr can confirm this, was they were generally supportive of the changes they were seeing, especially more the front-ending of the information and the, and the public process part of it. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I guess I'll, I'll jump in now as well. Um, yes, we, we obviously had a number of conversations with members of the development community and, and certainly the changes that we're proposing in our report tonight and in this presentation are very much reflected and have been refined since the first iteration that we had shared, I think back in November um, was our initial meeting with the development community to discuss these recommendations. So, you know, the, the idea of creating a withdrawal fee um, was really in response to their feedback and creating a pre-app process that allowed for multiple technical circulations was in response to that feedback. So um, I think, you know, in the end, the, the final changes that we've proposed here tonight certainly reflect that feedback and their experiences of going through the process. And, and as uh, Director Park has indicated, we did reach out to, you know, members of the 
public who regularly participate in our planning process to present these ideas and receive their feedback. And um, we actually made some amendments to our proposed changes in response to their feedback as well. So there, uh, our initial idea was um, for the community meeting, we, we didn't have a sign being posted on the property. So in response to feedback that we received from members of the public, we have uh, proposed to include an orange laminated sign on the property with that community meeting during the pre-app. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Chinani, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to say like whether it's option one or option two that are implemented, um, I really support reviewing and optimizing the process just to be more efficient, which is great. Um, I just want to clarify, um, with optimizing the process, will processing an application be more cost effective than the cur current process? Through you, Chair, that's a great question. And our hope is yes, because we're spending less time doing administrative work, like preparing the very in-depth public meeting reports that we currently do. It does contain a lot of detail. And the details are important, but by changing the format to the community meeting format, um, the consideration here is that the developer is going to submit a community meeting form that will contain all of the details associated with their application to give us that sense of what they're proposing. There will still be exhibits attached to that, which could involve elevations, aerial imagery, the things to support that actual uh, conceptualization of what they're proposing, and their zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, to really demonstrate to us what they're proposing to amend in terms of our bylaw um, to support their application. So all of those details will be summarized and appended to a report from the manager of development approvals. Each one could be its own exhibit. So property happening at 123 Street would be exhibit A, 234 Street would be exhibit B, and then it would still give an opportunity for members of the public to hear a presentation from each of those applications at the community meeting reviewing the details of the community meeting report um, and then providing feedback to the developer early on in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shays, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Park, thank you to you and your team for this report. I can just imagine the time and effort it's taken to get to this point. Um, I know there's a lot of stakeholders that are involved within this process, and I also understand that we don't control the process. It's the provincial government that's done the straight timeline, but city staff could do all, everything properly and in line, but with all the stakeholders, such as other departments from different levels of government, uh, different co contractors that are involved, or even the applicant, that we could still go past the timeline and there still could be a refund, correct? Through you, Chair, that is correct. There are, well, we do have a number of technical reviewers internal to the city that we can have direct conversations with. There are external review partners, such as the Conservation Authority, the Ministry of Transportation, uh, Bell Canada, Hydro One, CN Rail, that are vital to the process in order to implement these applications, but take a significant amount of time on average to get back to us. I think we averaged 120 days to hear back from CN on certain applications from time to time. 60 days for um, Hydro One, 90 days sometimes for the Ministry of Transportation. I might have the numbers reversed, but they're, they're rather large, they're significant. So by front-ending some of their review in order to get buy-in through the zoning by amendment pre-application or site plan control pre-application, we're helping to safeguard our processing of those applications by not having it included or not only requiring on their comments at the time of a complete application. Thank you. Um, I agree fully that earlier public engagement is a positive thing. Um, my question is, would there be enough information to share with the public with these early public meetings? Through you, Chair, uh, in our opinion, we're setting up this process to provide appropriate amounts and significant amounts of information up front. So for a zoning bylaw amendment pre-application, there will be technical details that are submitted with it that are visible on DASH. So everything that would come forward as part of that early consultation will be public facing. There might be, depending on the application, traffic impact studies, environmental impact studies, heritage work, maybe preliminary planning justification that would come to support those applications that members of the public could review, as well as the summary form, the community meeting form, elevations, 
site plans, and the zoning bylaw amendment that they're proposing are all key parts that I know our members of the public look for that we attach as exhibits to the report. So we want to make sure that there is sufficient information up front that members of the public can understand what's being proposed as well as members of committee so that appropriate dialogue can happen. Thank you. Um, also agree that in regards to the, the applications by the applicant, um, the applicant should be declared in incomplete uh, if something is missing. The owner should be on the applicant uh, to provide the complete application before the information start, like process is started. So I see that's moving forward. That should probably ease some of the timeline as well. Through you, Chair, yes, that should ease some of the statutory requirement timeline pieces if we are deeming an application incomplete. There is still provisions in the Planning Act, so we do have to be mindful of when we deem an application incomplete because if a developer feels that they have submitted all required documentation, they can appeal our incomplete application um, to have it heard at the Ontario Land Tribunal to figure out whether we, they did submit enough information to be deemed complete. So it's one that we're going to have to be very diligent and smart with should we go down that road when we're specifically looking at an application. And for those details, we would be looking to our partners in review internal to the city, the other departments, to confirm whether or not um, the submission reports meet all of their technical requirements in order to be reviewed comprehensively. Thank you. And actually, the most important question which I have, do we have enough staff to complete the process, or do we need more staff and resources? Through you, Chair, um, as outlined by Ms. Flaherty and uh, Director Park, we are, I mean, culminating all of those pieces together, we are operating at almost 100% staff complement at this point. We have two vacancies, which we've hired for, and they do have a pending start date. So our staffing levels are almost at 100%, and we're, we're operating with a peak efficiency um, in terms of the number of bodies that we have in the department. We did do a review and an understanding of trying to see if we needed to increase our staffing complement. And, and at this point in time, given the number of development applications that are coming in, we do not see the need to hire additional bodies to process applications, especially given the uh, efficiencies that will be achieved by changing the format of the public meeting report to a community meeting report. That's time previously spent drafting reports that planners can now utilize to process development applications. That's not saying in the future we might need to bring on a few additional bodies as the city continues to grow and our applications continue to get more complex. Uh, but I'm going to turn this over to Director Park who can speak in depth as well. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Barr. I just wanted to add to that. I think it's also important to keep in mind here, even if we add more planners and chairs, we're still got the timelines that we're dealing with. And if you recall back to the start of the presentation, um, or if you watched the chair's interview uh, earlier uh, that he had, the, we're, that, that process is out of our control. Uh, we're, 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 we're sort of, if a applicant uh, takes a long time to do the resubmission under the current process, then there's a problem. If we're waiting 120 days to hear from CN, that's a problem. We can't control that. So even if we have more bodies in the chair, that isn't necessarily the solution. And I would agree with Mr. Barr at this point in time that our staffing level, given the amount of applications we are receiving and processing, is at the exact uh, level it should be, but it's certainly something we will monitor, uh, I think, as we go through this process and, and, I guess, evolve into it and adapt to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, that's everybody. Anybody want to go to round two? Seeing none, we'll adjourn the public meeting and begin the business meeting. Can we have an approval of the agenda? Uh, Councillor Shanani and Councillor Shaves, approval of the agenda. Everybody raise your hands. That's you too, Mr. Osterhoff. Thank you. Uh, number three, confirmation of the minutes. Mover, please. Councillor Osterhoff, Councillor Shaves. All in favor? Passes unanimously. Disclosure of pecuniary interest? Probably not. Delegations, none. Briefings, none. Business, none. Motions, none. Notices of motions, none. Other business, none. Correspondence, none. Date of next meeting, June 14th at 6 p.m. Call for adjournment. Councillor Shaves, Councillor Chinani, all those in favor, and we are adjourned. Good night.